And it kind of all culminated at this coffee shop in Seattle because all major conversations end up at coffee shops in Seattle. And I was basically there talking with the divine going, what is the best way that, what, how should I live my life? What is the best way to respond to this life that you gave me? It's not, it's not a big epiphany, but I was like, you know, it seems like the best way I should spend my life is doing the things I'm best at. And as I looked through my list of things that I was good at, I came to the conclusion, like, I think I should spend my time making art. And I got to tell you that that decision, that epiphany, was really disappointing. Because, look, there's a lot of important things going on in the world. There's wars, hungers, political strife, education things that need to be fixed. The way that I'm supposed to spend my life is, like, going into a room and, like, painting while I'm crying, going, oh, the humanity. Like, that's how I'm supposed to spend my life. That seems like a big waste of time. And I, in that moment, I thought of a metaphor, this uh, cartoon called Captain Planet. All right. Now, if you don't know, Captain Planet was, this, was the best environmental campaign for kids ever. So the premise of the cartoon is that the Earth is sick. And the Earth spirit Gaia, played by Whoopi Goldberg, is, decides to send out these five magic rings to teenagers across the world. Brilliant idea. And then they take these magic rings and they fight evil people who want to pollute the planet. So there's like... There's earth and fire, and then, like, people will, like, make these giant copiers that don't print anything, but just waste paper, and then they come and fight it. And there's also wind and water, and, and then there's this fifth power, this fifth ring, and it's really quick. you got to watch it. Here it comes. That kid in the woods, he's got a pet monkey. That's it. That's all you get to see. And then if they can't defeat the bad guys, they combine their powers, and it makes Captain Planet. And here's what Wikipedia says. Mati uses the power of heart to instill caring, passion, and sympathy into the people of the world to care for the planet. So here's the scenario. There's good and evil duking it out, right? And then there's this one guy with this ring going, I just want you to feel. That's not, that guy sounds like he's going to get his butt kicked, all right? That's who that guy sounds like. And I felt like in this moment, in this coffee shop in Seattle, what God was offering me was the heart ring. If this is what you want me to have, I'll take it. It's not what I would have chosen, but I'll take it. But can I ask one thing? Would you show me? Just show me. Show me how to use this. And I'll say this. If you want to change the world in any way, you can have all the power in the world. You can have all the guns and all the money. But you don't have the power to change people's hearts. And to wield the heart ring is to learn the conversation of the heart. It's to learn how to, what it means to be human, what it means to be alive, what it means to be afraid, what it means to be happy, and, it, and it's communicating those ideas. I'm not a farmer. It's probably because I'm a city boy and I'm not a farmer and I never had a sea yoke, but um, this is what a yoke looks like. And uh, a yoke is super interesting. Um, I actually have a video that I want to show you. Uh, so this is a guy using a yoke. So um, a yoke is actually always intended for two. And so when a farmer has a new, less experienced uh, ox or cattle that he wants to learn how to be in the yoke, what he does is he takes that younger, inexperienced ox and he puts it with an older, wiser ox. And as they go and they start plowing the field, uh, the older, wiser ox teaches the younger, wiser ox how to be in the yoke. And so you know when they've learned, when you look at them from the side and you only see one set of legs, it's when they become perfectly in step that the younger one has learned how to be in the yoke from the older one. When I look at this passage, I used to think about it like that Jesus was kind of giving us like, a, like an okay offer, but not a great one. Like he was like, take my yoke upon you because, you know, you're, you're heavy laden and burdened. And I was like, oh, so I have this like big burden. I'm like, oh, I'm so weighted down. And then Jesus is like, I got a slightly smaller one. <laughs> I'm like, oh, I guess that's better, but I'm still burdened, right? <laughs> it, didn't, it, it didn't seem much like a relief <laughs> or rest um, because I had it wrong. What he's saying, he's like, you're trying to plow the field all by yourself. And that's not my invitation. My invitation is to get in the yoke with me. And we're, you know, we're faced with a whole new series of things that we have to figure out. 
Like, we have to learn how to communicate with one another in like a whole different way that the world has never had. Because most of the time it's been face to face. And so we can be like, I don't like you. And the person's like, that hurts my feelings. Like, I'm sorry I said that. And we don't do that again, right? But now it's like, I don't like you. I'm going, I'm going, right? Like we don't, it's just on a screen. We don't ever see people's responses and we can be dismissive. And, and we, yet we have the words of Jesus who we're learning from. And he's like, I want you to love your neighbor as yourself. In fact, that's like the summation of everything. And I want you to like love those who are persecuting and pray for them. But you're like, but you don't know how annoying that person is because you never had the internet, right? <clears throat> I don't know if you've gotten this, but I got this Facebook message. She wrote me this note that was kind of, it like started good. It's like, oh, it's so good to hear you struggling because like when I met you years ago, you were really arrogant and full of yourself. And, you know, and then it kind of goes through like three more paragraphs of that without the first sentence ever being mentioned again. Do you know, you know, have you ever had this when somebody's like trying to give you a compliment, but it's just their chance to put you down again? And I just wanted to be like, hmm, hey, apparently you got the handbook for how to be a jerk. Congratulations, you're a master at it. You know, like that's what I (laughs) wanted to respond because it really hurt me. And like it, it was a hurtful message to me. And I knew, like I could feel Jesus being like, this is what I'm talking about. Like, okay, so we're in it. Like, this is what I'm talking about. <laughs> I'm like, I know, but I want to answer meanly. And he's like, don't do it. This is not what I'm talking about, right? <laughs> and I'd like to propose that maybe it has something to do with the greatest commandment, right? Where somebody asked Jesus, what's the greatest commandment to follow? And Jesus says, love God and love your neighbor as yourself, right? Now, I grew up Protestant. We did a really good job about talking about how to love God, and we did a really good job about talking about how to love our neighbor, but we never really covered that last segment of it where it says, as you love yourself. And maybe because we just thought it was arrogant or a bit narcissistic, and who likes those people who are filled you know, with so much like self-love and are always talking about themselves? But I actually think that it's really, really important because like, you can't really love God if you secretly hate who he made you the entire time. And you can't really love your neighbor if you have the same rules and judgment on yourself as you're secretly and unintentionally putting on them, right? We can only really exist and have a faith in God when we go, thank you for making me. Thank you for my life. Thank you for creating me. And when we receive that love from the originator, we reciprocate it. That's all we're asked to do just to take what we've been given and then put it out. And you might be like, Scott, like, how are we starting an arts conference and you're talking about loving ourselves? It doesn't really make sense to me. Well, I just want to say this, is that all of us are going to find ourselves as we're in our calling um, that it's not going to work out. That it's not, we're not going to always get paid for what we do. We're not always going to really get acknowledged by what we do even in our own faith communities. But I want to know if you're going to hold to your calling and why you're going to hold to that. And I think it has something to do with the greatest commandment again, which is this. When we're looking at the world and we're looking at all that's going on, where should we go? What should we do? I mean, there's like a refugee crisis and a hunger crisis and a water crisis and a politics crisis and an education crisis. Like, should... Where do I go? Should I be a part of that? Should I be a part of this occupation? Like where, how do I even know where to start and what I should do? I think we start with the greatest commandment. What does it look like for you to love God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength in the world and to love your neighbor as yourself in the world? And if you ask that question to yourself, I think that's the person that God is calling out. See, because I think a calling is never given to us as a way to go, this is going to be your occupation. I think a calling is given to us to reveal who we really are in the world, our true self, the self that we work from that goes, I'm loved and I'm able to give love in this way because this is who I know I am. Because our calling isn't really about what we're doing, it's about how we do it, 
like to work from a false self is to go, my calling, I'm trying to work to earn identity. And if shame, shame is that. Shame is going, I'm working to find identity. And love is, I'm working from identity. And when I know my identity and I know I'm loved and I've done the work, it's not that it's easy, right? I'm pr pretty sure we all have a pretty healthy dose of self-loathing that we have to work out. But this is our practice. I would say that this is the practice that most influences how I am an artist now, is sitting and listening and receiving and then going, how do I take that into the world?